Hey everyone, it's Jasmine. On today's episode of The Slain Project, I'm going to be going over the MMIW Winnipeg, and I will be looking at the cases of five women to see if the same man is responsible for their deaths and disappearances. Also, if you like this cardigan I'm wearing, I'm going to leave a link to it in the description box. Let's get right into it. Amber Gubash, Claudette Osborne Tayo, Vanessa Bruer, Hillary Wilson, and Cherise Hull. These young ladies were all last seen in the city of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Three have turned up dead and two have never been found. The Red River. Winnipeg has a population near 800,000 and about 10% are indigenous. So about 8,000 First Nations live in the city. A lot of the indigenous population in Winnipeg come from rural areas in Manitoba. The indigenous population already is targeted for violence, so naturally this condensed population has seen more than its fair share in Winnipeg. The Assiniboine River meets the Red River in the middle of the city and cuts through it like a knife. The Red River is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Many missing indigenous women and girls are found dumped in this river after they have been killed. Then there are the many who have plunged or swam out into the river in hopes of ending their own lives. Most have been successful and some have never been found. The river almost seems to thrive off all the bodies that end up there in the most sinister way. The MMIP epidemic is just one genocidal form against the first people of North America. This modern-day form of genocide has been a long-standing problem in the U.S. and Canada for decades. Technically, it has been an issue on North America since 1492, the year the NATO population had first contact with Europeans. Drag the Red Despite the grim situation of the river, there was a group of friends that banded together after the death of Tina Fontaine to form Drag the Red. Drag the Red searches the river bottom of the Red River in hopes of finding evidence such as clothing, jewelry, or even body parts of the missing and murdered of Winnipeg. They have found human teeth before, but have never found a body. They do, however, think that their efforts have sifted some bodies out of place because some bodies were found soon after they drug the river. Tina was a 15-year-old girl from Seguin First Nation who was exploited on the streets of Winnipeg and dumped in the Red River, wrapped and taped up in plastic. Her body was found on August 17, 2014. A Caucasian man by the name of Raymond Comier was charged with her murder but was acquitted by a jury of his peers. Soon after Tina's discovery, in November 2014, a teenage girl by the name of Rennell Harper from Garden Hill First Nation was found in the Assiniboine River. She was sexually assaulted, violently beaten, and left for dead in the frigid waters. Two indigenous males, ages 17 and 20, were apprehended and charged with her assault. They, they also assaulted another woman that same night. One of them posted a picture online of themselves wearing Rennell's jacket. The 20-year-old named Justin Hudson was sentenced to 23 years for his role in the crime. Although these two cases are not connected, they are both very disturbing. Around this time is when Drag the Red was being formed. A woman by the name of Bernadette Smith was deeply disturbed by the death of Tina Fontaine, as was most of Canada. Bernadette is one of the founders of Drag the Red. She wanted to do something to help with all the missing and murdered women and girls in Winnipeg. Tina was found in the Red River and there were others before her as well, such as Felicia Solomon in 2003 and Tiffany Skye in 2011. Bernadette wondered how many other girls could be on the bottom of the river. She couldn't sit around and do nothing. She wanted to make an impact and stand up for her people. One of Bernadette's co-founders and dedicated surfers also has a sister missing. Kyle Kimach's sister, Amber Gubash, went missing in 2010. Another young woman by the name of Fanessa Bruer 
was found murdered in 2007. In this video, I will go over the theory that these three women were picked up and most likely murdered by the same man. Claudette and April have not been found. There is a suspect description that I think links the three girls. I will also go over the cases of two other girls, Sharice Hull and Hillary Wilson, that are often said to be connected to Vanessa. Winnipeg Police Department and RCMP formed a task force in 2011 called Project Devote. The goal was to investigate and hopefully solve cases of the missing and murdered of Winnipeg. The project closed in 2020 and only solved one case out of 30 being looked at. They were never able to connect any dots with the murders and disappearances of the MMIW of Winnipeg. All the women and girls in this video were Project Devote cases. I should point out that law enforcement is usually hesitant about publicly stating serial killer evidence, but they also cannot assume that each missing and murdered person has separate offenders. I think because the native population is in a condensed area of the city, it greatly confused the Winnipeg police. There were too many connecting webs. A lot of these women and girls knew each other. Most were from the same neighborhood. Some did drugs together and worked the streets together. Most all these women dreamed about escaping their street lives and living an addiction-free life. Some longed for the days where they could raise their own children. All of these women have family that love and miss them very much. Please keep this in mind as I make my way through the video. The only person responsible for their deaths and disappearance is the person who abducted and killed them. I believe everybody should be able to go about and live their lives without the fear of being attacked and murdered. Amber Gubash. Amber was born on November 5th, 1990 and was from Sapotoic Cree Nation. She had a rough upbringing. Her mother committed suicide in 1999. She also had an older sister who died that same year. Her older brother, Kyle Kimach, stepped up and did his best to take care of Amber and another sister, Ashley Gedz. Kyle made the decision to move to Winnipeg, but had to leave Amber behind. She was too young to move with him to the city. Amber eventually made her way into the group home system. She bounced around, and when she was old enough, she joined Kyle and Ashley. They were all happy to be reunited. They all missed each other so much. They began to bond as a family and catch up with each other. She was very friendly and talkative. She enjoyed meeting new people. On Wednesday, November 10th, 2010, five days after her 20th birthday, Amber went missing. She was in the, com was in the company of two male friends and went to visit her uncle that day. They all hung out and had some drinks. After she left her uncle's home, Amber and her companions went to her best friend's house, Roxy Breer. Roxy also has a murdered cousin, who I will be talking about later in this video. Roxy lives in the north end of Winnipeg. This area has a large First Nations population and is in an area known for drugs, prostitution, and native street gangs. There has never been any evidence that Amber was involved in this type of activity. Amber was there until about 11.45 p.m. She split up with her male friends at this time. Roxy had left her house a few minutes before Amber. She told police that Amber planned to hail a cab and return to her boyfriend's house on College Avenue. After she left the house, a friend looked down the street and spotted her getting into a truck at William Avenue in Isabel Street. The truck is described as mid-1990s, burgundy with extended cab, short box with 4x4 near the taillights, Chevrolet printed across the tailgate. This truck was last spotted moving south on Isabel Street. This info about the truck was not released until November 2017, seven years later. The suspect is described as white male, about 30 years old, reddish hair, might wear glasses, wearing a camouflage baseball hat. This man was known to frequent this area. Police believe he may have visited or worked in areas outside of Winnipeg. 
there is a 7-Eleven's convenience store on that corner. I do wonder if they got the suspect description from an employee at the store or were able to get video footage. The suspect's sketch and vehicle description is too detailed, in my opinion, for someone witnessing it from down the street late at night. Police have never located this man, but why did they wait seven years to release a description of his truck? So much time has passed that he most likely does not have the truck anymore if he was the person responsible for Amber's disappearance. Police did take one of Amber's cell phones for evidence. She was not carrying it with her at the time she went missing. They also took two books that had phone numbers listed. But if she encountered this man randomly, nothing probably came from examining these pieces of evidence. Winnipeg police are also on the record stating that they did not believe foul play was involved and that they just can't locate her. Police just initially thought that she was out partying. Amber was known to run away in her teenage years, but stopped doing so as an adult. She really had no need to as being of legal age. Kyle also has submitted a tip based off of the suspect sketch. He thought it resembled somebody he once knew. Nobody ever contacted him to follow up about this tip. It is unclear if police ever looked into this, but I would strongly suggest that Kyle resubmit this tip. Amber was most likely murdered and has never been found. Please be on the lookout for her. She was last seen wearing a white Adidas hoodie with gold stripes down the sleeves, skinny blue jeans, pink skater type shoes. She is 5'4 and 108 pounds. Long brown hair, usually worn in a ponytail. She had a very slim build. Her clothing will be small sizes. She is light complected. Amber's father died by a heart attack in 2014 and never knew the fate of his daughter. Her brother Kyle and sister Ashley are still desperately seeking answers. They are both volunteer searchers for Drag the Red. It brings them a sense of pride, well-being, and hope that the next pull could be their sister. Claudette Osborne Tayo. Claudette was born on May 15, 1987 and was from Norway House Cree Nation. She lived on the reservation with her family and had a happy childhood. Then one day when she was 12, her mom served the family porridge for breakfast. Maybe it was the way the bowl clinked the table, but her dad suddenly had flashbacks of being raped in residential school by a priest who would serve him porridge. He had to be hospitalized because his mind and body could not handle all of the evil memories. While he was trying to get better, Claudette was raped by a close family friend and some people did not believe her. She soon began running away to Winnipeg. She eventually met a boyfriend who began pimping her out. He would take all her money to buy drugs. Claudette became addicted to crack. She had two children before she met her fiancé at the time named Matthew Bushy. Matthew loved Claudette so much. He moved them away from the city so Claudette could work on getting clean. He knew all about her past and wanted to get her life in order. They had two children together, a total of four for Claudette. They were very happy living together as a family. Matthew said that Claudette was clean about 90% of the three years they were together. Claudette had given birth to her and Matthew's daughter named Patience on July 10, 2008. She had relapsed while pregnant and tested positive for drugs. Child Family Services, or CFS, said that Claudette and the baby could not be together until she completed treatment. It was decided that the baby would go to a foster home so Claudette could take care of herself and her other children. July 10th, 2008 was the last time Matthew ever seen Claudette. The decision was too much for Claudette. To deal with the hurt, she started smoking crack again. Two weeks later, at the age of 21, she would disappear off of the streets of Winnipeg. On Thursday, July 24th, 2008, Claudette was at the Leakin Motor Inn on McPhillip Street, now called the Four Crowns Inn. She began calling people she knew, asking to be picked up and brought home. Claudette had just given birth and was most likely still bleeding.
She said a man was trying to force himself on her and would not let her leave. It was rather late at night and no one seemed to be awake to answer her calls. She had left a voicemail for her sister Tina, but Tina did not have any minutes loaded onto her cell phone. Claudette began to get desperate to leave. She threw the man's keys out the motel window. When he had to go search for them, she made her way out of the room. As she made her way down the street, she frantically called for help from every payphone she came across. Her last known call was made on her calling card at 6.30 a.m. on Friday, July 25, 2008. She had an appointment to check into treatment the following Monday. The call was made from a payphone on Selkirk and King. Did this man from the motel chase her down? Or did she manage to escape him? only to be picked up by someone else who did her harm. This truly had to be the worst night of her life. Claudette was a street smart person. She definitely knew something was not right. When her sister Tina was finally able to hear the message after being able to purchase more minutes, it was two days later. She immediately called her family and asked if anyone had seen Claudette since she left the voicemail. Nobody did. She immediately reported her missing. As usual, the police said she was probably out partying. It was two weeks before they put out a press release about her. The surveillance tape at the motel was already recorded over by this time. When the media did report on her, they disrespectfully referred to her as just a missing sex worker. Police were working on the theory that she left with or had been taken by a truck driver from Calgary who was staying at the motel at the time. Her fiancé had stated police had talked with and cleared a person of interest. I was unable to determine if this was the same man from Calgary. Either way, I do not think Claudette would abandon her kids like this. She was abducted. Claudette is still out there somewhere, presumed to be a victim of homicide. At the time she went missing, she was 5 feet 6 inches tall, 130 pounds, wearing pinstripe pants and a black ruffled shirt. She had light brown hair and was light complected. Fonessa Bruyere. Fonessa was born on February 2nd, 1990. She was from Skegging First Nation. Fonessa lived in Winnipeg with her sister Tracy, Grandma Jeanette, and extended family. She is also the cousin of Roxy Bruyere the friend that Amber Gubosh was visiting the night she disappeared. At the time leading up to her death, Vanessa was in CFS care. She was kicked out of her group home one month before her death. She was only 17 years old. Why would CFS kick a 17-year-old girl out on the street? They seemed to just give up on her. She was always smiling and laughing. She loved spending time with her grandma and would often go with her to run errands. Anyone who has done this with a parent or grandparent knows that this could take all day. She enjoyed writing poems and would leave notes for her loved ones. At some point in her teenage years, Fonessa became addicted to crack cocaine. It is believed she fell under control of traffickers. She frequented a crack house on Burroughs Ave in Winnipeg. Her sister Tracy stated, that her and Vanessa started going there in 2005 when one of their friends would hang out there. Tracy believes Vanessa started going there without her. When Tracy visited the home, she said there was five to seven older males that lived there. Other girls would be there and they all would be getting high. Tracy never saw any sexual activities, but said there was an open bedroom that everyone would have access to. These five to seven men that were at the house would walk the neighborhood and solicit girls by offering them drugs. It sounds like maybe these men that lived at the house would give these girls crack and let them sleep and eat at the house. They would then probably pimp them out to the men that would show up looking for sex. Nothing comes for free. Shortly before Vanessa went missing, she visited her grandmother at a family get-together. When she left, she went around the whole room to hug everybody and say goodbye. This was unlike Vanessa. 
It is also said that a sex trafficker had threatened Vanessa and her family. Could this be why she hugged all of her family the last time she saw them? Perhaps her spirit knew something was going to happen to her and she made her peace before she left her family that day. Tracy is one year older than Vanessa. When they would be on the streets, they would try to look out for each other and stay together for security from the men that would be looking for sex. On the morning of Thursday, August 9th, 2007, the girls were at Aiken Street and Selkirk Ave. At about 6 a.m., a white male in a green two-door truck with tinted windows began to circle the block a few times before he picked up Vanessa. He is described as having short hair, mustache, and had a big nose. After about 20 to 30 minutes, Tracy began to worry that her sister had not come back. I could not find how much time Tracy waited, but the family began looking right away. They looked for about a week before they went to police. When they reported Vanessa missing to police, they said she was a known prostitute and was just probably out getting high. The police would not even take a missing persons report. In the series called Taken, police state that Vanessa was reporting missing on August 11th, 2007. I am more inclined to believe the family's version about police not taking a report because there was never a, a press release on Vanessa being missing. The only info about her came out after her body was discovered. The article posted on the screen has her aunt on record saying that there was a problem trying to get her missing persons report filed. The family gave up on the police but kept looking on their own. They never sought their help again. But on August 20th, 2007, Vanessa's body was found in a field on Mullard Road in Ritchie Street, north of Winnipeg. City workers had been cutting grass at the field and came across her body. When police knocked on the family's door, they knew something was wrong. They showed them a men's watch that Vanessa wore and told them of the discovery. Their lives were forever changed that day. Police have never released the cause of death, but her family says they were told she was naked and stabbed 17 times. The family was told there was DNA found under Vanessa's fingernails. I do not know if Winnipeg Police or RCMP have ever ran this DNA or not. I don't see why they wouldn't. Maybe they did and could not obtain a match in the offender database. Either way, they need to communicate this with the family. There are so many breakthroughs today with DNA genealogy. They could easily do a reverse family tree and pinpoint a match. Let's all just hope that they still have the fingernails to test. There was a bronze statue erected on the Seguin First Nation on August 1st, 2019. Seguin has a high concentration of MMIWG. The statue is called Life Flows Forever, and its purpose is to bring healing to the families of MMIWG and honors the fallen females who experience abuse, violence, and trauma in their lives. The missing and murdered men are also honored by the scarf the statue is holding in her hands. Vanessa's family misses her dearly and think of her every day. Her grandma is crushed by her murder and says she still thinks she will call her on the phone one day. Connected. Amber Gubash is the only victim that has a suspect sketch and a good idea of the vehicle used. If you compare the written description of Vanessa's suspect to the sketch, it is very similar. Also, the time that Claudette disappeared and the time Vanessa was picked up are very close. All three vanished on a Wednesday or Thursday. Claudette's ordeal started Thursday night and spilled over into Friday morning. Could this man have worked the graveyard shift and be used to being up in the late night and early morning hours? His days off could have possibly been Wednesday and Thursday. Also, when Winnipeg police released a composite sketch of the suspect in Amber's case, they stated that he may have lived and worked in the outside areas of Winnipeg. 
Police suspected that the man in the hotel room with Claudette was a trucker from the Calgary area. I personally believe that Winnipeg police thought that they were the same man. I also believe that this man is from the Winnipeg area, worked the graveyard shift, and lived alone or with his parents. One thing that really gets me is that these three women looked alike. They had very similar features. I do believe that Vanessa, Claudette, and Amber were picked up by the same man and probable unknown serial killer. The next two girls I will be talking about are believed to have made statements to police about the crack house on Burroughs Ave. It is unclear if Vanessa ever spoke to police about activities at this house. Her sister Tracy was unsure of that. According to family, Cherise Hull and Hillary Wilson were murdered in separate ways from each other and Vanessa. I am unsure if they would have been killed by the same person because serial killers tend to stick to the same MO. There have been a few cases where they have killed in different ways. Perhaps we are looking at a serial killer who was evolving, getting better each time he killed. But for argument's sake, Sharice and Hillary both seen the vanish on a Wednesday or Thursday before being found slain in areas north of Winnipeg, just like Vanessa. The same days of the week seem to be a reoccurring theme for all the girls in this video. Law enforcement never officially released the cause of death or the injuries that Vanessa, Sharice, or Hillary were subject to. There could have been similarities. There was not a suspect sketch or vehicle description for Sharice or Hillary. I will let you decide if you think that Sharice and Hillary are connected to Vanessa, like they are often portrayed. They were all found in areas north of Winnipeg. Amber and Claudette have never been found. Could they also be waiting to be found in areas north of Winnipeg? Hillary Wilson Hillary was born on November 25, 1990 to her mother Gwen Wilson. They were from Norway House First Nation. She was also related to Claudette Osborne and Felicia Solomon. She was always a girly girl and wanted to be a beautician when she grew up. The family moved to Winnipeg. Sometime after arriving in Winnipeg, she started hanging out at the crack house on Burroughs Ave. She knew Vanessa and Charisse. They all hung out there. I have read that Hillary was also in CFS care like her two friends, but I cannot confirm this. Hillary wished to move back home to Norway House, but she never would get the chance. On Wednesday, August 19th, 2009, she was seen making a call from a payphone at about 8.30 p.m. at Selkirk Ave and McKenzie Street. I think she was calling her mom. Gwen said that Hillary had called her to say she would come over to help her get ready for her brother Dino's 18th birthday party the next day. Hillary told her mom the names of the people she was with. She never showed up that night. The next day, on Thursday, August 20th, 2009, shortly before 3 p.m., a 14-year-old boy walking his dog found Hillary's body at the corner of Perimeter Highway and Highway 59. The dog would not stop barking and wouldn't listen to the boy's commands. Hillary's life came to an abrupt end. She was only 18 years old. She was found on her brother Dino's birthday. However, police did not notify her mother Gwen until a few days later. I do not know if she had her identification on her or if they used fingerprints to ID her. Maybe someone at the police station recognized her, but they did not need Gwen to ID her body. When Gwen was finally able to view Hillary's body, she was covered in bruises. On her arms, it looked as if a crowbar or a baton was used to hold her down. What Gwen saw was just the visible areas. She made statements that Hillary was hit in her head and body. She put up a fight and was found within 24 hours of her murder. I hope there is DNA available. I was never able to confirm if there is. Winnipeg police have never officially released the cause of death. Her mother, Gwen, remembers the names of the friends who Hillary said she was with. 
she has communicated this with the police. Whenever Gwen sees these individuals, they turn the other way and do not wish to speak to her. When Gwen would put up posters asking for information, someone would tear them down. Gwen also spoke of a video one of Hillary's female friends made. The video is made after Hillary's death and the female friend speaks very badly of her. She says in the video that she knows what happened to Hillary. It is very detailed as if she witnessed or participated in her death. Gwen believes this friend can solve the case and urges her to speak up about what she knows. Was this female friend jealous of Hillary? Why would she speak such vile words after Hillary's death? If she is responsible in any way, who helped her? Charisse Hull. Charisse was born to her mother, Barbara, on July 7, 1991. Charisse was always smiling and loved her family very much. If you were down, she would tell you the corniest jokes to make you laugh. The family is Ojibwe and is from the Ebb and Flow First Nation, which is about 180 kilometers from Winnipeg. Barbara left Charisse's dad in 1998. He was a very violent and abusive man. The Hools eventually ended up living in Winnipeg. Charisse and her sister Jessica chose to live with their dad and his girlfriend. The couple would often have domestic violence issues and the cops were often called. CFS became involved and removed the girls from their dad's care. When asked if they wanted to go live with their mom, the girls said no. Charisse was nine years old at the time. I am unsure why CFS would not have just placed them back with their mother. If there was not any previous negative history, why would CFS have a problem returning them to Barbara's custody? Barb believes it was because she had strict rules for her household and school. The girls were free to roam and do as they pleased with their dad. In foster care, Charisse met other foster kids who introduced her to crack cocaine. She became addicted and it would soon consume her life. Charisse began to frequent a house on Burroughs Ave in Winnipeg that would give the girls food, shelter, and drugs. In return, they would offer themselves for sale. Charisse eventually became pregnant. She had her son on November 5, 2007. Charisse was sure that this is what would turn her life around. But when he was born, CFS took him from her and placed him in foster care. This broke Charisse's heart. She wanted to get sober so bad. She once seen her cousin Alexis on the street and asked if it was true she was clean and sober. The cousin said yes. Charisse asked her cousin if she could bring her to the treatment center she attended. The cousin agreed, but she would never see Charisse again. Charisse called her mom, Barb, shortly before she went missing. She asked her mom to phone her CFS worker and ask for a drug warrant for her to get her place into a locked facility. Charisse thought this would be the only thing to get her off crack. There was no room in the treatment center and the request was denied. Another note on this case is that Hillary Wilson had wrote on Charisse's Facebook memorial page after she was found murdered. They seemed like they were close friends. Most press releases say that Charisse was reported missing on Thursday, May 21st, 2009. This is not correct. She was reported missing for the last time on Friday, June 26, 2009, after not being seen for a couple days. She had returned home after initially being reported missing on May 21st. She was most likely seen early Thursday and reported missing late Friday. Her mother says that she last saw her on Thursday, June 25th, 2009. They were planning her birthday party for July 7th. Six days before Charisse's birthday on Wednesday, July 1st, 2009, her body was found near Sturgeon Creek in Rosser, Manitoba. A construction worker stumbled upon her body. 
Some reports say she was face down in the creek. Police have not released the cause of death, but her mother, Barb, had stated she was told Charisse was drowned. Some reports also say her death was not ruled a homicide. I don't think it's possible for anybody to drown themselves in the manner Charisse was found. Barb hadn't heard from Charisse for about a week before she was found. She was only 17 years old when she was murdered. On the Taken series, police say that Charisse was last seen on Friday, June 26, 2009, on the 400 block of McDermott Street in downtown Winnipeg and was reported missing later that same day. I totally respect law enforcement, but Winnipeg Police and RCMP have a horrible track record on how they handled MMIW of Winnipeg in the past. I believe she was last seen by anyone who personally knew her on Thursday, June 25th, by her friend we will call AF. There also was not any missing persons alert on Charisse on or after June 26, 2009. They only picked her up in the media after she was found dead. It seems like Charisse's family kept a close eye on her and they reported her missing several times before. Charisse was desperately crying for help from CFS and they did not help her. The following account is from Charisse's friend AF. She provided testimony to the MMIW inquiry when they came to Winnipeg and wished not to have her name on public record. It is believed she was the last person to see Charisse at the house on Burroughs Ave. AF met Charisse while they were both in CFS care. They both went to the crack shack on Burroughs Ave. The day and date are unknown. AF was deep into her addictions at the time. They bought the same crack from the same people at the same time. AF's crack piece lit her up for six to seven hours. She was too paranoid to leave the house with Charisse when she left. Charisse was leaving and told AF to wait for her until she came back. It is unknown where she was going, presumably to work for some more money. Charisse and AF would get each other high. Whoever got picked up first for a date would buy the next round of drugs. Their main spot to hustle was on the corner of Juno and McDermott. From this statement alone, I could tell these girls were really close. When a female sells herself for drugs, she will not usually get anyone else high. She went through a lot to get those drugs. People kept coming and going from the crack shack. Some repeat customers even commented that AF was still high off the hit she had hours earlier. She didn't even want to smoke anyone's dope because she was too high. Finally, a girl she knew came in and served her a hit of crack. AF snapped out of her daze and immediately asked for Charisse. She was told she didn't come back yet. Charisse never returned that night. She was never seen alive again. The police found AF about two days later and asked her about Charisse. This would probably be the first Saturday after she was reported missing on Friday, June 26, 2009. She told them the same things I just went over about the events at the crack shack. She also told them that she thought her crack hit was laced because she got so high off of it. She thought she was going to die that night because she was so high. She felt that maybe the dealers at the house were trying to intentionally separate them. If you know something, please say something. We have to stop this vicious cycle. Talking to police about cases like this is not snitching. It's doing the right thing. Whether the perpetrator of these crimes is an indigenous person or an outsider, we need to stand up to them and let them know that we will not let them get away with this. They are harming our women. They are the cradle of our civilization. Standing by and not doing anything will not solve this epidemic. If we stay silent, the cycle will never be broken. There are many indigenous groups out there that are striving for the same goals. By uniting and standing up, we hope our voices will be heard. We stand in solidarity. 
Another thing that deeply troubles me is that almost all these girls were dealing with CFS. They had either been in CFS care themselves and or their children were also in CFS care. CFS is a government agency that is designed to protect the children and families of the children. They are supposed to care for the kids and help the family straighten out their lives so that they can properly care for their children again. But they make it extremely hard for families to get their children back. I think this system is designed for failure. The Indian child welfare systems in both Canada and the U.S. have very parallel histories and both work in similar ways. Bernadette Smith, Claudette's sister, is an elected member of the Manitoba legislature and helped pass the law banning poverty as a reason to remove children from their homes. Bernadette is also the co-founder of Coalition of Families of MMIW in Manitoba and Drag the Red. She is such a strong leader and I do admire her for that. If you have any information on these cases, please contact Winnipeg Police Department or the Manitoba RCMP. So what did you think about the video? That was a lot to take in. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. And I really hope that these families could get some answers one day. I will see you next time. Thank you.